Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Wednesday evening edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. Today is October 19th, 2011. I'm Aaron Dyke, sitting in until Alex returns tomorrow on both the radio and nightly news broadcast. Coming up later in the program, we have InfoWars contributor Patrick Henningsen. He'll discuss the move under the Obama administration to put troops in Uganda and other parts of Africa under the larger AFRICOM plan, as well as the stoking of war in Syria and Iran. But first in the news, Occupy Wall Street continues to draw attention, this time for calls for global governance. A group of prominent leftists, including Noam Chomsky and Naomi Klein, uh, say we shouldn't rein in groups like the IMF and World Trade Organization or the GAG20. Instead, we should institute democracy, so-called. And there are calls for global governance that are interchangeable with global democracy. And they've issued a text that's been supported by the United Nations group UNFA, UNPA, which seeks the establishment of a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. We have a clip now. United for global democracy. United for global democracy. October 15, 2011. On October 15, 2011. United in our diversity. United in our diversity. United for global change. United for global change. We demand global democracy. We demand global democracy. Global governance by the people for the people. Global governance by the people for the people. Inspired by our sisters and brothers in Tunisia. Inspired by our sisters and brothers in Tunisia. In Egypt. In India. In Libya. In Libya. Libya. Israel. Hermanos y hermanas in España. Hermanos y hermanas in España. Greece. Yeah. We too call for a regime change. We too call for a regime change. Global regime change. Global regime change. Today we demand replacing the G8. Today we demand replacing the G8. With the whole of humanity. With the whole of and so there you have it. While the Occupy crowd remains very diverse, including many in the fetters, you have these moves for global governance. Uh, they're comparing it to Mubarak and Egypt and other aspects of the Arab Spring, just as people like Al Gore called for an American version of the Arab Spring just prior to the beginning of Occupy Wall Street. Then at the same time, uh, as Obama and other Democrats trying to co-opt this movement, we have reports that State Department agitator is now advising the Occupy movement. Ahmed Maher uh, helped lead the Egypt's Arab Spring that resulted in a military dictatorship, calling that movement successful. Now he is helping to steer the Occupy Wall Street crowd. The report is in from Paul Joseph Watson today, but it's very alarming, and we have some of those quotes now. Years before the Egyptian Revolution, the U.S. was quietly preparing for a global army of youth cannon fodder to fuel region-wide conflagrations throughout the world, both politically and literally. Mars April 6 organization had been in New York City for the U.S. State Department's first alliance for the Youth Movement Summit in 2008. His group then traveled to Serbia to train under the Canvas organization, which was also U.S. funded, before returning to Egypt in 2010 with the U.S. International Crisis Group, which is Soros-led, and its operative, Mohamed al Baradi would spend the next year building up for the Arab Spring. As part of his role in leading the revolt against Mubarak, Marr fraternized with the likes of Zbigniew Brzezinski and George Soros through their involvement in the ICG. That's a quote from Tony Cartolucci, uh, who's been following the issue closely and frequently writes for Infowars.com as well. And, of course, it's true. The State Department and other U.S. government entities were behind the Arab Spring, and now their assets are coming to the Wall Street occupation movement. So it's something to keep an eye on. We also have another quote. Egypt's Arab Spring has not led to democracy, but to another cruel dictatorship under which the military is killing minorities and imprisoning dissidents. Egyptians must take to the streets once again. That's Kareem Amir from the Daily Beast. Uh, but he's right. It is a total military dictatorship. Uh, they're supposed to be temporary, only to facilitate elections, 
Now they don't want to step down. I have this article today from the London Guardian. Jailed Egyptian blogger on hunger strike says he's ready to die and says he had rather commit suicide than be tried by a military junta for criticizing the army in a blog. Uh, so that's what happens in Egypt, and that's what they call a democracy, I guess. Let's try instead to steer that anger against what's happening economically into recapturing sound money, into uh, fighting back the Federal Reserve and other related issues. Now, we have a poll we discussed uh, briefly last night. We're going to cover it more in depth tonight. It was on Washington's blog, and they have a great analysis. Who is to blame, Washington or Wall Street? And this captures the whole sentiment behind it. They found that many of the liberals blame Wall Street, while conservatives tended to blame Washington. Of course, there's anger on both sides of that aisle, the false left-right paradigm. Now, let's see those numbers from that Pulse Opinion Research reported in the Hill. Now, overall, they found of likely voters, about 56% tended to blame Washington, while only a third tended to blame Wall Street. 11% were not sure, and then there's a gender breakdown as well. But as the Washington blog rightly points out, it's a crony capitalism issue, and obviously both Wall Street and Washington are to blame. People on Wall Street were guilty of committing fraud uh, with housing and the rest of it, but also the regulators, the government regulators, were also guilty of fraud. They're all part of this epidemic, and what people are sick of is bailing out these big banks while Main Street, while regular working people are continually punished by this economic downturn. But people like Hermanator, the Federal Reserve Nader, don't understand that. As you'll see in the debate clips we have coming up, the one candidate they always ignore is Ron Paul, even though he's the only one who's issued a balanced budget plan and the only one who's calling for reasonable policies. Let's go to those clips right now. And they said, oh, the world's going to come to an end unless we bail out all the banks. So the banks were involved and the Federal Reserve was involved. But who got stuck? The middle class got stuck. They got stuck. They lost their jobs and they lost their houses. If you had to give money out, you should have given it to the people who were losing their mortgages, not to the banks. But my point is this. What are the people who are protesting want from bankers on Wall Street to come downstairs and write them a check? This is what we don't understand. Yeah, and there's more up there, of course. Uh, but, of course, what they focused on uh, in all the media was the staged fight between Romney and Perry as they bickered back and forth. And, obviously, they always give Ron Paul just very little time. And you saw Herman Cain's comment there. Uh, he previously blamed the Occupy Wall Street clout crowd for blaming Wall Street. What do you want, a, a government check? No, we just don't want these backdoor bailouts where the Federal Reserve facilitates everything. Just today in the news, the Federal Reserve helped these big banks move their derivative assets into FDIC protection. That's going to cause even more problems. Uh, but then what happened with the debate itself? Ron Paul was again ignored in the polls, despite the fact he won the local Vegas Fox 5 poll overwhelmingly, a state he does very well in, by the way. But then in the national polls, it was Kane, Romney, or Perry in the International Business Times. It was Newt Gingrich winning in the Politico poll. In the Fix poll in the Washington Post, Ron Paul was listed as a loser. Why? Because of his suit, the way it fit. And there's a deceptive caption which implies that he may be the first openly gay presidential candidate to file in New Hampshire. That's the kind of treatment you see for the only person really hitting the key issues anywhere in the mainstream debate uh, within this false left-right paradigm. Of course, we know it's Ron Paul. Now, coming up, we have a special report that Mike Adams of Natural News and Rob Jacobson from right here at InfoWars filed for the InfoWars Nightly News. You heard Russell Means yesterday talking about the suppression of alternative cancer cures. Now they're going to profile the Brzezinski Clinic. Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski helped develop a cancer treatment called anti-neoplastins, which has been shown to vanish brain tumors in many children, but instead of getting grant money to help expand his research. He's been persecuted by the U.S. government and various medical boards. They've tried to throw him in prison, but Brzezinski has won many battles and continues to fight. Here's that piece right now. This is Mike Adams reporting for InfoWars Nightly News from the Brzezinski Research Institute in Houston, Texas. And we are here to talk about the suppression of medical science. The history of cancer research is something very different from what you've been told, and certainly very different from what the mainstream media has reported. There are cancer cures that really work, 
and some of the most innovative and pioneering research in the history of our world is being done right here at the Brzezinski Clinic in Houston, Texas, and yet the Texas Medical Board attempts to suppress the research. The National Cancer Institute alters the research findings. The FDA tries to go after them time and time again, but failing because the truth will always win out. And the truth is that this is one of the most important institutions for cancer research in America today. Now we sat down to talk with Dr. Stanislaw Brzezinski to get more information about why that's the case. Let's see what he has to say. They will harass you mercilessly for trying to be innovative, for saving people's lives, for publishing your results so that the others may follow you. So that's what they do. And they should be exposed because this is also some type of criminal activity. Because they are doing this, the other doctors cannot follow up what is the right way to treat the patients. When we began our treatment on genomic switches, well, we are really pioneers in the entire world. Now, many other researchers are going this way, and people begin to understand. You have articles, you have uh, TV programs about it. Um, now it's just a matter of time when the breakthrough will occur and the new approach to cancer treatment will be firmly established. The research ultimately was proven to have practical application to treat patient, and then, obviously, I became competitor, quote-unquote, to the other big guys in the field. So then the problem started. It turns out his discovery threatened billions of dollars in profits currently generated by the cancer industry, an industry which actively seeks to suppress treatments that actually cure cancer. They were looking how to take away my invention, and uh, they thought that the best way to do it would be to prove that it doesn't work in the clinical trials which we sponsored. So that's why they use lower dosages, that's why they discontinued the treatment after about a month, knowing that obviously this is too short time to have any good results. So this is pretty much criminal activity, because people came trusting that they should receive adequate treatment, and they did not. So I think uh, there should be a day when these people will be taken to court as simple criminals, because that's what they are, okay? Well, it's not up to me to do it, uh, but that's what I think the justice should be done, and that's what they should face, because they did it for money. Basically, we are fighting for the other doctors. Probably they don't understand it yet, but we are fighting for the freedom for the other doctors. The doctor should have the right to choose the best treatment for his patient, and uh, he should not be really told by the lawyers, by the people who have nothing to do with medicine, what to do. This is up to the doctor and patient. And as long as uh, the doctor is using a reasonable approach, he should be able to do it. That's what was typical for medicine for centuries, and that's what America deserves. Not really the doctors to be robots uh, who are told by the clerks from Washington or from Austin, Texas, what they should do. The doctors know how to take care of the patient. They should be given free hand, especially when dealing with advanced disease. That's what I'm fighting for. I'm fighting to give freedom to the doctors and freedom of choice to the patients who require treatment, who otherwise will die because there's no treatment available for them. Dr. Brzezinski developed a cancer treatment called anti-neoplastins, and it caused brain tumors to vanish in many children. There's nothing more important or rewarding to see some patients who arrive here uh, literally told that they had days to weeks to months to live and the decision to come here has saved their life, has given back to themselves, their families, their communities, their churches, their workplaces. I mean, they're becoming productive members of society. So to see that is a, a reward that I cannot put into words. Some of the notable innovations that we have at the Brzezinski Clinic are expanding our tumor profiling. We look at the tumor as a whole. We look at the genes involved. We look at the tissue. We sequence the human tissue, and we see all the molecules that are involved there. It's not just the same type of lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, per se. It's got a lot of different subtle varieties. So we look at different biomarkers in the blood, and we see exactly all the different variations that are going on. And right now, we're even going further. We're going further by analyzing these uh, circulating tumor cells of that cancer. So not only do we look at the tissue, we look at the uh, circulating tumor cells to better uh, formulate a treatment plan. 
they were convinced that when you are dealing with stage 4 cancer, obviously you can't cure it, there's only palliative treatment, and uh, whatever you can do, try to decrease the tumor, use such and such combination for everybody, and that's what you do. And after you, uh, for instance, expose patient to, say, three different lines of chemotherapy, uh, send the patient to a hospice or send patient to clinical trials. So that's how they were educated. And that's, they feel that they do the best because uh, they, were talk, uh, they, they were taught this in medical school and then in their training. And if somebody was trying to do something else, he has been punished. Uh, he has been investigated, his colleagues would attack him, and his license was, was in jeopardy. We are into the system of genomic switches, which are regulating cancer and many other processes, like, for instance, aging, memory, uh, they are involved in such uh, illnesses like Alzheimer's disease, for instance. So basically, this is more or less epigenomic reg regulation of the gene activity, which is playing perhaps the most important part. And uh, basically, this is a system of uh, the switches, molecular switches, which is regulating our life. It's an era that's been a little barbaric, and we're moving away from that, hopefully, especially with the surgeries. It used to be, let's just perform a radical mastectomy for everybody with breast cancer. It was called the Halstead mastectomy, the more the merrier, huge disabilities. Now we're moving closer to perhaps a lumpectomy. And the best surgeons nowadays realize that surgery for cancer is not even probably going to be an option in the future. It's going to be the molecules that are in the genes controlling the cancer. We have to take care of that. Now what we can do, we can take care of the changes which occur in our life, which is majority of cancer cases, and uh, the first event in such patients is typically not a mutation, but turning off the gene which protects against cancer. This is like tumor suppressor gene which is turned off. When this happens, uh, this would lead to mutation of the other genes, because part of the job of these tumor suppressor genes is to get rid of the cells which contain mutated genes. And if uh, these genes are silent, uh, switch off, then it's not going to happen. So find a patient will have more and more cells which will have mutated genes, and this can lead to cancer. So, and uh, such cells which contain these mutated genes, which were created during patient's life, can be completely eliminated through uh, the type of treatment which we are using, which means using medications which work on the genes, the gene combination of gene targeted therapies. And once you eliminate such mutations, once you eliminate malignant stem cells, then uh, the patient is cured. The patient can uh, live normally over 20 years without having any sign of cancer. And uh, that's what we are able to prove among our patients. Instead of giving him grant money to expand his research, the United States government, along with the Texas Medical Board, decided to persecute Dr. Brzezinski and try to throw him in prison. I thought I was fighting the right cause, but I knew that we can help desperate cancer patients. That's why I decided to fight. I knew that I was right, and I have a conviction that finally, if you are right, you're going to win. And it's not only in the field of medicine. You can see this in many other fields where uh, these people who really were causing a lot of problems, a lot of suffering, uh, they were not punished. They got financial awards from the do. They wanted to have big chunks of money coming from one of the pharmaceutical companies because they knew that they would receive royalties. Well, it happens the other way. They lost. The big company which uh, was trying to give them money now uh, was purchased by another company. So the, whatever they planned to do did not work. But it could work. Of course, I could, I could be now sitting in prison if uh, I wouldn't mobilize the people to help me. So it was just uh, coincidence or pure luck that I'm not really is subdued by these guys because they have a lot of power, which I didn't have. Today, after defending himself against countless FDA accusations of fraud, Dr. Brzezinski continues to treat cancer patients, many of which are cured of their cancers. Our patients, for the most part, have a great quality of life, especially some of the children who were treated with our antineoplastins. They essentially had little to no side effects. A lot of children that are treated with the conventional oncologic therapies 
they, they, unfortunately, their growth is stunted. They might have some cognitive deficits. But with a lot of these folks that are now adults, they have only health, great health. People are realizing something is not right, and they would like to make some changes. Hopefully we see some changes coming, and this will be changes for good. So there you have it, the history of the suppression of medical science, but yet hope for the future that these technologies may be embraced so that they can help the many millions of people around the world who deserve to have treatments that really work for cancer. This is Mike Adams, the Health Ranger, reporting for InfoWars Nightly News. Wow, that piece is amazing. It speaks for itself. But of course, uh, the very damaging chemotherapy using radiation is obviously not the only option we have. And we don't need to help out that kind of parasitic medical industry when there are other options. We need to open it up. Now, I want to remind you again that on November 3rd, in just about two weeks, InfoWars is having another money bomb, and Alex will do another 24-hour marathon broadcast. We need your support to help spread this broadcast and the radio show and the websites, help get the word out so we can reach as many people as possible before it is too late. So if you can help us financially, please do. If not, please help spread the word of the information we cover right here. We'll be back after break with more news, and then coming up, Patrick Hennigson. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. We have Patrick Henningsen coming up on the other side of these headlines. The Stuxnet virus is back. Son of Stuxnet. Researchers warn of impending cyber attack. That's ABC News saying a new computer virus using nearly identical parts of the cyber superweapon Stuxnet has been detected on computer systems in Europe, uh, where everything's about to crash, by the way, and is believed to be a precursor to a new Stuxnet-like attack, a major U.S.-based cybersecurity company today. But remember, Stuxnet was admittedly confirmed to be a false flag baby of Israel and the U.S. Kurt Nemo, among others, wrote on it back in January 2011. Um, Lieberman and Susan Collins, among others, helped use Stuxnet to push for their cybersecurity bill entitled the Protecting Cyberspace as a National Asset Act of 2010. Of course, we know the cybersecurity agenda has been heavily covered at Bilderberg for the past several years. Uh, furthermore, this article discusses how officially neither American nor Israeli officials will even utter the name of the malicious computer program, much less describe any role in designing it. But Israeli officials grin widely when asked about its effects. And we have another quote, too, demonstrating that part of it. Mr. Obama's chief strategist for combating weapons of mass destruction, Gary Samore, sidestepped a Stuxnet question at a recent conference about Iran, but added with a smile, I'm glad they're here. I'm glad to hear they're having troubles with their centrifuge machines. <laughs> and the U.S. and its allies are doing everything we can to make it more complicated. <laughs> that was in the New York Times, January 15, 2011. In other technology news, Disneyland workers now have to answer to an electronic whip. Uh, this refers to laundry and uniformed hotel workers at the Anaheim location in California for Disneyland and Paradise Pier, where a scoreboard with their names, employee names, compare work speeds and also their uh, productivity, really trying to drive them into working overtime. Of course, that's just in the U.S. It's also happening in Florida, by the way. You'll remember in China, a uh, factory that produced toys for Disney's Toys uh, Cars 2 movie was caught using child labor, uh, using forced overtime, and there were even some employees who committed suicide. Uh, that's just the kind of things going on in the workplace, despite the happy appearance of everything in the TV and movie world. In other news, the spy phone how someone could use your iPhone to find out what you're typing on your computer, how an iPhone can be turned into a spy phone by deciphering vibrations to record what's being typed on a nearby computer t keyboard. Millions every day place their mobile on their desk at work, but in fact, it could be hijacked by hackers to track what they write in emails. Of course, the entire uh, smartphone has been designed as an NSA snooping device from the get-go, uh, you know, iPhones were previously caught accidentally logging all the locations of its users and other aspects of it. 
Meanwhile, the NSA and Google are admittedly developing a hardened kernel for the Android phone so they can do classified government communications, various parts of the government, from the Obama administration to the FBI, the Justice Department, the Army, and even first responders have all expressed interest. The Army wants to take Android into combat, the White House wants to dump the BlackBerry, and first responders want to replace their insecure radio equipment. Uh, which did play a role in 9-11. That's right, Real Life Android Police writes Android Police blog. And that is just some of the Big Brother news that's going on. Now, coming up, we have Patrick Henningsen, and he will discuss the AFRICON move to put U.S. troops into combat in four African nations pursuing the Lord's Liberation Army in Uganda. And joining us now is Patrick Henningsen, a contributor for Infowars.com, and author of the blog, 21st Century Wire. Patrick, thanks for joining us. It's good to be here, Aaron. Thank you very much. Now, you've recently written the article published on InfoWars yesterday, Obama's Great African Military Safari. Uh, obviously, he has uh, agreed to dispatch somewhere on the order of 100 troops to Uganda and really four other, four total African countries. Tell us what's going on. Okay, uh, this is all about, at the moment, uh, the announcement is saying that he's sending uh, 100 troops, uh, unspecified, but it looks like uh, special forces, um, troops to Uganda. And the main reason for this, or the, uh, the party line is, that these troops will be used to fight the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, led by the uh, Bin Laden-esque kind of evil character named Joseph Kony. Now, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army has been around since 1987, okay? So this is no uh, new sort of event in Uganda, and there's incursions over the border to the north, and there's lots of fantastic stories, uh, some of which may be true, some of which may not be true about uh, Kony impressing child soldiers and uh, taking children as sex slaves, etc. cetera. Um, this is obviously great headline news in America. Now, the only thing is, uh, with regards to Uganda, um, what you have in Uganda is you have a president for life, okay? You have uh, Museveni, he's been in power for the good part of 25 years. Uh, there was lots of um, discrepancies with the last election in 2011. The European C Commission on Fair Elections uh, upheld the election, uh, there were observers there and so forth. Um, so it, it all is not what it appears to be um, on this story with East Africa. But really, the, the, what you need to understand and what I tried to uh, detail in my article is that this move, latest move, is kind of more of a formalization of a policy that actually started under George Bush, uh, Bush the Younger, in 2007 which is the African uh, Strategic Command Initiative, AFRICOM, uh, mm -hmm. will be the acronym for that, okay? Now, Bush, in, in 07, sent 17 counterterrorism experts uh, to Uganda to deal with the, uh, apparently, with the Lord's Resistance Army. But, you know, Obama went to Ghana in 2009 and made a speech saying that, and I can quote him, he said, whether it's a genocide in Darfur or it's terrorists in Somalia, these are not African problems. These are global security issues. So really what you're seeing here is, is this kind of gradual creep of AFRICOM. Now, if you, for those who are not familiar with AFRICOM, you can go online, you can download their PDF strategic initiatives. AFRICOM is basically, it's the stepchild, it's the African stepchild of PNAC which was Project for a New American Century. Okay, um, a lot of your viewers and InfoWars readers will be very familiar with PNAC. This was a neoconservative uh, think tank creation uh, with people like Donald Rumsfeld, George Bush, um, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl. And really what, if you take this in a kind of sports analogy, uh, George Bush basically uh, was moving the ball downfield uh, with regards to PNAC, and then AFRICOM uh, in 2007, 2000, and in 2008, uh, Obama got the pass, he was given the ball, and here we are in 2011, 
and Obama is the guy, ironically, America's first African American president, is the guy who's going to take the ball over the goal line and establish a permanent U.S. military presence on the continent of Africa. Well, exactly. And we know this is part of the larger military industrial complex. Uh, you know, the same PNAC used to be Team B, the same people arguing for always greater military spending in the Cold War. But at the same time, it is significant that they've taken the first black president and opened up all these fronts in Africa from Libya and now in the central part of Africa there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, let's not forget Libya, North Africa is part of Africa. Okay, um, and Libya is a multicultural country. North Africa has people who have brown skin, black skin, uh, white skin, everything. So, you know, you cannot discount North Africa as not being part of Africa. Obviously, from a strategic point of view, from a geopolitical or an industrial, uh, military industrial complex point of view, there is major strategic differences between the North African Horn and the Sub-Saharan Africa. OK, mm -hmm. now, obviously, you know, you've got the, I mean, we're, we're, t we're talking about the surface of this issue now. But if you look into the African documents, the, in, in the documents themselves, and I took a, a slice out of this and put it in my article, uh, which is uh, entitled uh, Obama's uh, African Military Safari, um, there is a big um, uh, reason in there which they're using. And, you know, they, it's to evict China out of Africa. And because they believe that because China has achieved uh, this kind of stage of economic development in Africa, they're everywhere. They're building roads, railroads, uh, infrastructures, coal plants, uh, whole business districts in places like Angola, in places in whole industries in places like Ghana. They're in Nigeria. They had a massive amount of investment in Libya. They're in Algeria. They're everywhere. Okay, they're in the Sudan. There's Chinese in East Africa, Tanzania. So the Chinese are everywhere. Obviously, the Chinese got a major jump on the United States and the Anglo-American side of the empire. Mm -hmm. China has got a different approach. Uh, the, the, the traditional colonial approach of the West was to, you know, to subjugate an African country and then to basically rape it for all its resources and use it as a source of, of uh, cheap raw materials, which would then be processed in places like India, and then it will eventually make it to Europe, for instance, or you know, to America. Now, the Chinese had a totally different uh, approach to this. The Chinese would go in and do kind of a, more of a barter arrangement with the host country. They're saying, "Well, you need roads, um, you need infrastructure." China, China wanted to lay down that infrastructure and is willing to invest millions and billions of dollars to do that. And they'll bring in their own labor, they'll bring in their own people, their own engineers and everything. And then Africa could seemingly kind of enjoy and reap the benefits of this Chinese work down the road and also open up the country for business. Angola is a perfect example. You know, it's a, a really third world country with very little infrastructure. And now uh, Angola can actually be a trade center for that side of uh, Southwest Africa in very good proximity to South Africa and the BRICS countries and Brazil across the Atlantic. So the U.S. is, uh, I think, bent, and the Anglo-American empire is really bent on uh, really getting the Chinese out, either by sabotaging their economic uh, interests, which is, or, or just outright destroying it. And this is what you've seen in uh, Libya. Well, it's an massive. overlap of the, uh, of the colonial interest for the Anglo parts as they merge with the uh, Chinese interests. But at the same time, it is also part of the geopolitical board. And uh, so let's talk about some of the other uh, tensions that are heating up with Syria, uh, the new provocated hoaxes pointing towards Iran as well. And uh, China, of course, always on the back burner of those tensions as well, if things go to a truly wider war. Yeah, I mean, like, well, just quickly, just talk about China. China just signed a, a potentially a massive deal with Iran to provide gas. Uh, so I think in the 21st century, uh, where we used to have wars over certain things and maybe even a, a, over petroleum or land or uh, resources. It, energy, energy is the big one in the 21st century. The Congo is finishing a hydroelectric project 
that is supposed to provide Southern Europe with something like 40% of its uh, the base load for things like power. You've got natural gas. Uh, in Libya, you've got fresh water, uh, which is potentially could make Libya the breadbasket of the Mediterranean, much like the California San Joaquin Valley became the breadbasket of the world. Uh, you have the, potentially the same thing 20 or 30 years down the line through this massive irrigation project that Gaddafi undertook about 30 years ago. Now, do you think, and I, and I think it's quite obvious, no one else would invest billions in, in that kind of a structural project for, for, for a water system. Uh, only, only a state could do that. And there's so few states left uh, who own their own infrastructure. I'm not advocating socialism by any means, but I'm saying uh, private industry would not make that sort of investment uh, seeing ahead 30 years. Qaddafi did. Uh, the Great Man Made Water Project is probably the, uh, the, of the wonders of the world, technologically, is probably in the top five uh, for a man made engineering feat on the whole planet in the history of the world. That was done by Muammar Gaddafi, and it was done for Libyans. And it was everything that Qaddafi did, if you look at his record, since uh, as far back as I could see in 30 years or something, every penny was reinvested in Libya. It was for Libyans and, and also for Africa and for Africans. And now you have a complete reversal of this agenda right now. Uh, Libya has fallen, um, and then AFRICOM has now got a much stronger foothold now in the co on the continent. Uh, so the dominoes are slowly falling. Um, if, with regards to Syria, uh, a lot of people in Syria are afraid that it's going to go the way of Libya. Uh, and the biggest, the biggest thing about Libya, the absolutely the biggest thing above the, the fake uh, 1973 UN resolution, uh, above the NATO bombing and the complete, what I believe will be the crime of the century. Uh, it's like a smash and grab. It's like when you drive your car into a high street shop and then smash the window and just take everything out. This is, this is NATO and America and Britain and France's uh, version of a smash and grab. But the biggest thing was the media. Uh, basically, the way they reported Libya, this is brand new. So we didn't have embedded reporters like we did in Iraq or Afghanistan. It was basically fresh. There was still press able to move around. But the, the amount of news that was coming out of Libya that was completely fake. And I like, I'm probably going to write a story about this in the next uh, couple of days just to put it all together. But it's absolutely unbelievable. Everything you heard was a lie from A to Z. Timetables were switched. Um, they said Tripoli fell with no resistance. That wasn't true. They didn't report a million person march or something like this in Tripoli back uh, a few months ago that were showing support of Gaddafi. Now, if the world had seen the true story on the ground in Libya, this, this, they, they wouldn't be able to get the kind of uh, complicit support from our, our people that will back the foreign policies that we're trying to push which is of regime change. Uh, Qaddafi gunning down his own people. They said that he killed 6,000 of his own people, that he was using his air force to kill his own people. I mean, these are absolute mental, complete fantasy ideas that were taken right to the UN. You know, this is supposed to be the highest table on the planet, a political diplomatic table with complete lies and fabrications in order to get a resolution, which turned into fait accompli of a, a complete bombing raid and regime change. Syria, we're going to see the same thing. It's already happening. Stories of soldiers defecting. This is a very powerful one uh, in the Western mind. And the other one will be uh, soldiers turning on soldiers. There was a fake story about a woman who was abducted a couple of weeks ago. I wrote a story for InfoWars about that. Uh, Zainab, uh, and she was beheaded and decapitated, and they sent the body back in pieces. And she shows up, lo and behold, 10 days ago saying, oh, I'm alive. This isn't true, you know. But that story was based... Once those stories get, once those memes get put into, uh, slipped into the mainstream media and then into the consciousness of people in the West, it, you really, even if you've uh, debunked them and shown them that they're completely true, that they, they stay, somehow they stay, and the impetus stays. Like the Iranian Saudi uh, diplomat, uh, Mexican Zeta uh, assassination plot, even if it's completely debunked, 
even if they've shown that it's a total sham, uh, Hillary Clinton is still running at the State Department, running with this thing. It's unbelievable. But these are the times we live in. Uh, it is a media war more than anything. It is an information war more than anything. And Syria is it, Syria is the key point of all this because Syria shares a border with Israel, Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Jordan. So, uh, and of course, Syria Iran is, is tied directly to it as well, foreign policy wise. Yeah, Iran is, and so is Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. So, and also the other thing is Syria uh, traditionally is, and Syrians are, and there are a lot of Palestinians, expats living in Syria. Um, you could be in the millions, okay, who are used to be refugees or have repatriated to Syria. Syria is very pro-Palestine and very anti-Israel. And the other thing, they've been fighting over the Golden Heights for years. So if, you know, Assad, you know, like him or not, and I would say the same thing about Gaddafi, you know, Gaddafi had to manage an incredible amount of uh, tribal, uh, natural tribal uh, warring tribes and tribes who are competing against each other for years. And this goes right, right back, um, you know, hundreds of years, could go back thousands of years. Gaddafi's a strong leader. He kept it under control. Um, and he kept uh, Libya's unified identity and they had stability, okay? Now the same thing you could say about Saddam Hussein. I don't, I'm not a fan of Saddam Hussein, however, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, kept uh, an orderly house. The same thing with Tito in Yugoslavia, kept an orderly house for a very long time. Once Tito was gone, uh, a, a slow sort of degeneration of managing all these Balkan right. tribes and states. And the same thing you have uh, in places like Libya and places like Syria. Assad's a strong leader. His father was an even stronger leader. And the reason was is because they, Syria is fighting for a, a chunk of its territory. If they didn't have a strong leadership there, um, you, you know, Israel had a piece of South Lebanon since 1982, 84. A whole chunk of South Lebanon was under Israeli control until recently. And the same you could say for the Golan Heights, uh, the same you can say for you know the Dead Sea, in, in near Jordan. Uh, so it, it's it's very it's easy for us to sit and judge and say you know well you know they should have an open democratic society and they should have you know this and that and the other. But these countries, Syria is on 24/7 alert for the last more than last decade. They're on a 24 hour state of alert war. Well, and obviously. So it's, it's, Obviously, so it's destabilization, not democracy. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just speaking from the, the point of view of somebody maybe that's watching this that just doesn't understand why we just can't, you know, come out and have uh, rainbow coalitions and, and orange revolutions and velvet revolutions. It's not quite that simple in that part of the world. But you do have an incredible amount of provocateuring. You've got foundations who have uh, National Endowment for Democracy, uh, you've got Freedom House, you've got all these George Soros-backed organizations that have been involved in these Twitter revolutions, have taken people out of that country and trained them on, on a third-party soil to go back and to organize. Uh, mm. Kissinger did the exact same thing in Chile uh, when Allende was president. They would take the uh, management and the labor union leaders out of Chile and to put them on these uh, and they would go back and that would that would help turn the wheels of the overthrow of whatever democratic or stable regime was there all right and, and, and this and, well I think we'll leave it there for now Patrick obviously there's a lot going on with the geopolitical situation and we'll of course continue to check in with you as things develop of course and that is it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Alex Jones will be back tomorrow uh, with more hard-hitting information. Until then, stay tuned, spread the word, and help support the InfoWars Network and this broadcast. Thank you. Good night.